Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Today's project in the New Yankee Workshop is this handsome bookcase, and its design was inspired by a real beauty we found at the old Sturbridge Village. That's coming up next, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. In early America, there were very few books in private homes. Therefore, not much need for bookcases. But here at the bank, they kept the books, right? Right, they're in there. I bet they knew where every nickel and dime was. This is a nice piece, a freestanding bookcase with a cornice detail at the top. And inside, an adjustable shelf feature. You thought that was a modern device. It appears that the cabinet is built from some pine, but if you look at the inside of the door, you see that it's pine on the inside and that it has a mahogany veneer on the outside. So I suppose today we would build a bookcase like this with plywood. Now to build my bookcase today, I need two and a half sheets of plywood, one and a half sheets of three quarter inch for the sides, the top, and the bottom, as well as the shelves, and one sheet of quarter inch for the back. Now I've chosen birch plywood because the plywood is much more stable than a solid wood might be. I'm not going to get any warping or splitting. And I've chosen this birch because it's a nice smooth surface. It'll paint up nicely. And you could stain it, in fact, if you wanted to. Now it's expensive, but not as expensive as good premium pine might be. Now my home center doesn't offer pre-cutting of plywood, but some places do. You might want to have them make the initial cuts for you right at the lumber yard. That'll save you some time, but make sure they do it right because this stuff is still fairly expensive. Now I'm going to cut mine on my table saw here, and I've set the fence up so that it's 24 inches from the rip fence to the center of the blade. That way I'll get two equally wide strips, eight feet long. And because I'm doing it alone, I need a little bit of help, so I put these rollers in front of the saw. And they're set up so that they're just a little bit lower than the top of the table saw, and they're also perfectly parallel with the front of the saw. If they were out of parallel as you push the wood through, it might tend to walk off in one direction or the other. So with those all set up, I'm ready to go. Wish me luck. Now another thing is that in my shop here, I have my workbench behind the saw, and it's about the same height as the saw, so it helps hold up the plywood. What you want to do is make sure that the plywood is tight up against the fence and not out at an angle like this or like this. The idea is to keep it perfectly parallel to the fence. Keep an eye on that as well as the blade and just take your time and push it through. This is one sheet that's been ripped in a half, and now I need one more half sheet, so I'll rip this one over here. Now, you know, if you don't have a table saw that rips to 24 inch widths, and you can't get your lumber yard to make the initial cuts for you, you could think about using a straight edge and just an ordinary circular saw. You can do a pretty good job with that, but this is really the way to go. So now I need two pieces, 11 and 3 quarter inches, for the sides of the bookcase. And I'll set my rip fence, again making sure to get an accurate measurement between the fence and the saw blade. And I'll rip those two pieces from one of my half sheets. Now for my shelves. As you can see, the shelf is just a piece of plywood with a pine nosing. And I need to rip the plywood to 10 and a half inches. Let's see, if I rip 
three strips eight feet long. That'll give me enough material for six shelves. Let me set my saw to ten and a half. Now, the next piece that I need is this bottom stationary piece. And you'll notice that it's wider than either the sides or the adjustable shelves. And in fact, it needs to be 12 and an eighth inches. And I'll cut that from my remaining strip here. But first, I want to cross cut it in half, which will be four feet. Okay, now I'm going to rip it on the table saw, which is already set at 12 and an eighth. Now I need a piece for the top up here. And that fits between the plywood on the back and the face frame. So it needs to be 11 and 3 eighths inches. And I'll cut that from my remaining strip over here. This part of the operation is cutting to length. And this is one of two side pieces cut to six foot five and three eighths. This will be the top, which is cut to three feet. This will be our bottom, cut to two foot eleven and a quarter inches. And while I'm at it, I might as well cut my shelves, which will be thirty four and three eighths inches. With these scrap pieces, I can show you how we join the bottom to the sides. We'll cut a dado in the side pieces into which we'll just slip our bottom. And that's just a regular dado joint, which is a very strong connection. And we'll do that right over on the table saw. Now to do this joint, I'm using a dado head, which I've set to take out a three-quarter inch wide by three-eighths inch deep dado. And it's just two blades that are set at angles to one another. And I'm going to use my T-square in combination with my rip fence, which is something you should never do unless you have this guide block in place. Without the guide block, you stand the chance of bind up and possible kickback of the wood as you push it through. The guide block is just a reference so that my dado will end up in the right place. In this case, from the bottom of the side piece to the top of the dado is five inches. So as I push it through, it starts me in the right place, but it also gives me clearance here so that I don't have any bind up and possible kickback. So now I'm ready to start with one of my side pieces and make that dado cut. Let me see if I can show you how we're going to join this side to the top, because you can't really see it with all our moldings in place. What we're going to do is put a rabbit in the top piece, and that'll sit over the side pieces like that. And we'll do that operation on the table saw also, again using the dado head. And I've set it up so that it'll remove 3 quarters of an inch by 3 eighths of an inch. And I'll do that to both ends of my top piece.
Now, the back of the bookcase has this quarter-inch plywood, which is recessed into the side panels. And the reason for that is, is that when you look at the end of the bookcase, you don't want to see the edge grain of that plywood. So what we have to do is make a rabbit joint in the side panels, which will be 3 eighths by 3 eighths. And I'll do that over on the table saw. Now, I don't need the T-square anymore, but I've put this piece of wood on the rip fence to protect my blade from hitting the metal. Our adjustable shelves are held in place by these shelf standards and clips. And I suppose we could just mount these standards right on the surface like this. But for a couple minutes extra work, by cutting two dados, they'll be recessed and it'll give you that nice clean look. The next objective is to join all the pieces together using glue and screws. Okay, with some glue in the dado, I'm ready to install the bottom piece. And I want to keep it about three quarters of an inch in front of that side panel to take into account the thickness of the face frame. Okay, the next thing that I have to do is cut this piece of quarter inch plywood to fit on the back. Okay, with a light bead of glue applied all the way around the back, we're ready for the plywood. And you want to make sure that this bad side is facing up and the good side is down towards the inside of the cabinet. Just set it down in place. And I'll fasten it with these little five penny box nails. Okay, with the back all nailed in place, tip it up and clean off any excess glue that might have squeezed through with a damp sponge. And then I'm ready to start building my face frame. Now let me show you how this face frame assembly goes together. But first, I'll take off this crown molding header piece. And I can pull off this frame. And you can see it's just three pieces of wood, two styles, one on each side, and a rail piece across the top. And they're joined together with a half lap joint that's glued and screwed together from the back side. Now let's start over here with our pieces for our bookcase. This is the header piece, three feet long four and three quarters inches wide. And I've set up the radial arm saw with the dado cutter in it to remove just enough material to make the half lap joint. bit of glue here for our half lap joint and we'll slip them together and make sure they're aligned and just use some small 5 8 inch long screws really just to hold it in place until the glue sets up. Okay with some glue applied all the way around the edges of the plywood I'm ready to put my assembled face frame on just set that down in the glue. And I'll just use some six penny finish nails to attach it all the way around the edges. All right, let's work on the base next. Now, I suppose I could glue and nail all these pieces right to the cabinet, 
But if you were going to build one or more of these and join them together, to move them around, you have to be able to take them apart. So you want to have the base piece as well as the head piece removable. Now this is just pine. And I put a beaded edge along the top of our base, just using my router with this beading bit. And then I fitted all the pieces with 45 degree miters on the corners and then added these glue blocks to the inside with screws to hold everything together so it's nice and rigid. Now I've got a piece clamped down to my table here, five inches wide and about six feet long, and that's what I'll need to put the base on our bookcase. Now I'm going to do my mitering right here on the table saw using my T-square. But first, I'm going to rough cut the pieces with enough extra to do my final fitting. So I need two pieces, 14 inches, and the piece left over will do the front. I'm going to bring the pieces right over to the case and mark the orientation of my angles. And that's just so that I don't get confused, because whenever you do mitering, it's very easy to cut the angle the wrong way. So I'll come back to my saw, adjust the blade to 45 degrees for the miter cuts, and then we're ready to make the pass. Let's begin to fit these pieces together. We'll check the front piece against the side piece, and that fits really well. So now we're going to hold it firmly in place, go across to the other side, and just put a little pencil mark where we want the miter to be. And it's a good idea to have that just a little bit long because you can always recut it later. And then also mark the orientation of the angle. Now to make this miter cut, my mark is really on the wrong side of the board. It's over here, and the blade is here. So I'll flip it over, and using a square, just transfer a mark along the back of the board, marking it on this side. And that'll give me a guide to start through the saw blade. And again, I'm going to cut it a little long, because I can always trim it up later. Before I can make my final check of the fit, I have to cut my side pieces to length. So I'll just set the front piece on the cabinet, then take the side pieces, putting the mitered edge down, and mark this intersection right here, which will give me the correct length, and I'll just square cut those. And now I'm ready to see how well these fit together. Okay, that fits pretty good. Now I'm ready to glue it up. These glue blocks really do a great job at strengthening those corners. So some glue on the block itself. Set it down on our side piece. And then some glue on the entire miter and a little more on the block. And I can fasten it to this front piece. OK, a few screws, and that'll hold the base in place. 
Now, the top section of our bookcase may look complicated, but in fact, it's not that bad. It's three pieces of wood, a 3 and 5 8 inch crown molding that I picked up at the lumber yard, this angled piece right here that I made on the table saw, and a piece of 1 by 5 that I've rounded over the edges. Now, the bottom edge was rounded over with a half inch rounding over bit in the router. And to make it a little bit softer on the top edge, I'm just going to use a quarter inch rounding over bit. And I'm ready to do that now. Let's take another look at our sample top piece. What you have to remember is that this top board hangs over the side of the cabinet to accept the crown molding. And when it's all set in place, we want to make sure that the head piece up here hangs over the side of the cabinet two and three quarter inches. Now over on this side, which is really the private side of the cabinet, which you don't see, we'll have miter joints, which I'll do on the table saw, and then screw them together. This little guide allows me to make perfect blind screw pockets every time. Now this top assembly gets fastened to the cabinet with screws. Okay, that takes care of the back of strip for the crown molding. And that was just made from a piece of inch and seven-eighths stock that I beveled at 38 degrees. And what it'll do is accept the crown molding and, in fact, will fasten it to that strip. That 38 degrees, though, will vary depending on where you purchase your molding. And now our crown molding, the final touch. Not the easiest thing to cut and make nice, tight joints. First of all, you need a miter box. Not necessarily a power one like this, but you do need a miter box. And you always set the molding in upside down. And what I like to do is simulate what's happening at the cabinet. Because the molding, if it's not set in the box correctly, will end up at the wrong angle. And that will drastically affect your fits. So we'll use a piece of scrap backer and set the molding against it. And then clamp this guide strip down. And that'll simulate what's happening at the cabinet and we'll end up with perfect cuts every time. What do we ever do without this carpenter's glue? A little bit of glue on the joint, and I've already put some on my cleat. I'll squeeze it into place. That fits real good. And nail it in place with some small four-penny finish nails. And now, for probably the most important part of our bookcases, the shelves themselves. Let me show you how I made those. We started out with these pieces of plywood. And this would be the front edge if we left it unfinished. And that's not very good. So I took some 1 by 2 pine. And we'll apply that to the front. It'll give it some thickness. And it'll also give it some strength. And what I did is just round it off the edges using a 3 8 rounding over bit. Let me show you. A little bit of glue, my milled front piece, put on with some four penny finish nails. And that's all there is to making shelves. Let me share a trade secret with you. Whenever I build these bookcases, I don't want to install these metal standards until after I've done any painting or staining to the inside of the cabinet. Believe me, it's real difficult to paint around them. But once the paint is dry and the standards are in place, set those shelves in and you're ready to start enjoying your bookcases. Well, what do you think of these colors? Brick for the outside of the bookcase, green for the inside of the bookcase. I think that's a pretty good choice. But before I dare put any of these finished colors on, I want to apply a coat of good latex primer. Well, that primer was a perfect start to finishing this bookcase. And after it dried overnight, 
I took some 220 grit sandpaper and sanded all the surfaces perfectly smooth. I also took the trouble to use some glazing compound to fill any of the nail holes. And now I'm ready to start the finish coat. I'm going to do the inside first. And this is the green color that we've chosen. It's a latex enamel, and it should really hold up well. Boy, this brick color looks great against the green. And I'd say that this bookcase is just about ready for the books. Well, how about that? It works. It actually holds the books. Now, I hope that with the help of this videotape and the measured drawing, you'll be able to build one just like this. If you've enjoyed this new Yankee project, you may want to try some of the others. There are projects meant for the workshop, the garden, the kitchen, and many more. So whether you're a fan of shaker style, or colonial, arts and crafts, or Chippendale, there may be a norm project you'd like to build. Whether it's a clock or a gazebo, a picnic bench or a Windsor chair, a child's toy or a sailboat, visit the New Yankee website at www.newyankee.com for a complete listing.